Uh, moving on with regards to beneficial ownership and how to research. According to the Financial Action Task Force, recommendation 10, an institution should take reasonable steps to verify the identity of beneficial owners. So it is a requirement under FATF uh, recommendations, basically meaning it is a requirement to, and with an AML to find out who the beneficial owner is. However, the exact account opening procedures and customer acceptance policies will depend on the type of customer, the risk, and the local regulations. Okay, many jurisdictions have moved to a centralized registry. This will be the big thing, uh, moving towards a centralized beneficial ownership registry. It will happen one day. Uh, in the US with the Money Laundering Act, that's basically part of the Money Laundering Act is to move to that. Make sure you know and follow the requirements for your jurisdiction. Um, Many, uh, while there is debate um, in other jurisdictions whether an organization can rely on representations made by a potential customer, the U.S. explicitly allows such reliance for both the beneficial owners and the controllers. Your organization may rely on the potential customer's certified representation as long as reliance is reasonable and the organization believes the customer is truthful. So now you have a list of beneficial owners, but in some jurisdictions, you must not go further than, than to verify the identities of those customers. The exact requirements of the verification will be based on the organization's uniquely tailored risk-based approach. Okay, so, you know, whenever you're in an organization, you will have policies and procedures that look into that. Okay, customer due diligence, another major component of KYC, uh, CDD for a natural person. Customer due diligence, or CDD, is research you need to collect information and documentation to gain insight and understanding into the nature of the and purpose of a customer's account. Okay, so you're looking at basically the behavior of the account. The goal is to help your organization monitor transactions later throughout the lifetime of this customer to make sure everything is going as expected for natural persons, real people. The due diligence information is fairly straightforward. Some of it might already have been required by your jurisdiction's minimum requirements. You want to learn why this account is being opened, how it will be used, what sort of transactions you should anticipate, the frequency and an expected amount of those transactions. Of course, a lot of this is tailored towards the transaction monitoring side, which has thresholds in how they create alerts. And those alerts obviously might create risk, risky behavior, which needs to be mitigated in financial crime risk. So it's all linked together. Occupation is relevant because some have higher inherent risk than others. Underlying factors of a high risk occupation include lack of transparency, you know, consultant, uh, import export, <laughs> some good examples. Cash intensive, whether the occupation provides them particular access or is linked to a high risk industry. High risk occupations include professional service providers such as attorneys and accountants and restaurants, convenience stores and car washes. You can search online for lists of high-risk occupations. Learn for yourself what factors make a occupation's high risk because the lists don't include every occupation. The country of residence and nationality of a customer also could be risk rated. Some countries are a higher risk for narcotics trafficking, terrorism financing, and other illicit activities. Nationalities is one of many risk factors in risk rating a customer. It should not be used as the sole factor preventing a customer from banking and never be used for discriminatory practices, okay. The account purpose and expected activity are important. An account purpose may be as simple as a deposit account for salary. You know, so usually when you have an account purpose, you need to write a, a describe a purpose. So you just, they'll say like, oh, this is for this kind of product, you know. Especially with, at, 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 at corporate level, where you're looking for products of, of the clients. And it gives you an idea. A customer source of funds may be easily identifiable for collecting information on the purpose of the accounts, such as, like a deposit account for a salary, but if not, if it's not asked, and clearly document the source. For example, if the purpose of the account is to save for the purchase of a home, and the source of funds is not obvious, so you would need to research. Okay, uh, CD for a natural person. Case example: A potential customer, Miss Yu Singh, would like to open a checking account. Cool. She recently sold her home and is moving to a retirement community. Makes sense. She has lived in the same home for over 15 years and once ran a customer clothing business with her late husband. So she's old, has a late husband, been in the house for 50 years. She's selling it because she's moving to a retirement community. She has been retired over 20 years. Okay. The account is being opened because the big bank, the bank branch is closest to the retirement community and she no longer drives a car. 
Ms. Singh plans to use the account to direct deposit her monthly pension checks to fund an account. She plans to transfer the balance of her current checking account to turn another bank to your bank. Her expected transactions will be about $250 per month and will be used to pay for personal items, gifts for her grandchildren, and visits to the hairdresser. Her housing and food expenses will be taken care of by the retirement community. You should check to make sure her name, address, and date of birth agree with what you have been told. You should ask to see her current bank statement. You can check public records to determine that her house was recently sold. Everything checks out. You can accept Miss Singh as a customer. That seems pretty example. Normal, straightforward, awesome. CD for a politically exposed person. Case example. Your organization is open is asked to open an account for a teenage son of a CEO of a state-owned oil company in Africa. Red flag, red flag, red flag. He is coming to study college in your country. Well, that makes sense because he's going to have because anyone is a lot of these sort of foreign students. Then you know, they're they're going to live a life of luxury. They're not going to study hard. Many of them, not all, but many of them, and they need to basically go to a foreign school because they won't get into the other school in their country. You know, your organization takes a risk-based approach to CDD and applies guidance from the Wolfsburg Group. The Wolfsburg Group is a bunch of uh, well, a bunch of banks together working AML procedures and policies, which is an association of global well, here is this, which is association of global banks and aims to develop frameworks and guidance for the management of financial crime risk. For this reason, you should apply standard CDD, which should include identity verification and then overlay other due diligence checks. These would include, among others, establishing the purpose of the account, obtaining documentation, proving the relationship between the customer and the primary politically exposed person, or PEP, and an assessment of the political and corruption environment in the customer's home country. It's pretty full on, but yeah, you might need to do that. Customer due diligence for legal persons will generally be more extensive than for natural persons. Okay. You must always seek to identify the natural person or the per or persons or to who ultimately own and control a legal person. It's probably why it's more extensive. So you're actually just adding people. Typically, this is anything over 10%, such as individuals usually have a degree or control of the legal person. Knowing the nature of the business is vital when creating a customer profile. You need to know the purpose of the account and the type of activity your organization should expect to see across it. You should also undertake san sanction screening, politically exposed person identification, and adverse media screening using credible, credible sources and recognized databases. We're, get, we're going to go into that at some point. The first step in the CDD of a legal person is to understand the ownership structure and track back to the ultimate beneficial owners and controllers. Legal persons can take many forms, so you must determine what your customer is and the checks you must undertake. Once you have that, you can collect, uh, conduct a natural person, um, person identified verification in line with your organization's policies and local regulations. Then you must discover the type of business your customer undertakes. This is important for your allocation of the risk rating to ensure your organization is not facilitating sanctions breaches or bribery or corruption. A local supermarket is easily understood and is likely to be low risk. An importer of fruits and vegetables from a high risk country using trade finance for their business is probably high risk. Cool. Uh, you must find out from your customer what the account will be used for and the level of activity your organization should expect to see. This helps with the ongoing transaction monitoring. In the supermarket example, it is probably sales from customers and payments to suppliers. The importer will probably require f uh, frequent foreign currency transactions. Your customer must be checked for PEP status against sanctions lists and to ensure they are not listed. Any identified UBOs must be checked against these lists. A check for adverse media on databases your organization recognizes will complete the initial research. Okay, cool.